Up next and every Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern, tune into Grand Theft Auto Biographies with Guinness Walker. And don't forget Grand Theft Auto Geographies, Fridays at 9 a.m. Eastern. Only on Weasel, confirming your prejudices. Warning, this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. America. The land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. Taking notes? This stuff? Whoa! Pure magic. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets, causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Saints. Sinners and corruption. And nothing in between but the FIB. At the highest levels of government. Cut! Tonight, we will examine a man who directly competed with our own program for slots in the evening primetime, and with the likes of dirty cops and paid off judges for the title of most corrupt man in government. We will follow the actions of a man many of you already know a D list celebrity who masqueraded as an honest and reliable man of the people. You suck my d, Steve fing Haynes! We will witness criminal coercion, taxpayer-funded robberies, and enhanced interrogation as we follow the life of a G-man who would do anything for his country and himself. A man so blinded by his delusional patriotic fervor that he may have actually believed his actions were in service to America, Steve Haynes. This episode of Grand Theft Autobiographies brought to you by... My incredible supporters on Patreon. Sign up today to get all the music from my shows, early access, and a spot in the credits. If you enjoy this series, consider subscribing and hitting the bell icon to get notifications of new uploads. It costs you nothing, and it helps the channel tremendously. Thank you for watching, and enjoy the show. As no regular viewer should be surprised to learn, information on the early life of Stephen Haynes is covered in FIB-approved black ink, and as such, it is difficult to ascertain confirmed details on him prior to joining the Bureau. In our lengthy investigations, we could not even confirm if Haynes was born in the city which made him famous, though we suspect as much. We do know he was born in 1975, but who his parents were, what city or coast he called home, or why he decided to join law enforcement remains highly speculated. Based on some information available to us, we do believe that Stephen was born on the West Coast, and most likely in Los Santos itself, and grew up surrounded by gangland violence, which plagued much of the city around that time, even beyond the scope of what we will cover here tonight. Given that at the time of his death, Steve still lived with his mother in Los Santos, who remains unidentified, this may be further proof that he was born and raised in the city. Whatever Steve's motivations or upbringing was like, it seems safe to assume that he was raised on a steady diet of consumerism, American exceptionalism, and coverage of his nation's many wars abroad. By 1993, at the age of 18 and presumably right out of high school, Steve would join the Federal Investigation Bureau and immediately begin making a name for himself. Exactly how Haynes managed to join at such a young age, and presumably without attending college, remains a mystery, but it's possible, and perhaps probable, that he had family or friends in high places, which facilitated in his unorthodox acceptance into the Bureau's ranks. By 2004, when Steve would have been in his early 30s, he would become decorated enough amongst his peers to be given his own special unit within the FIB, and become boss to several other agents, whom he would now command as he saw fit. Among the men in his new unit were Andreas Sanchez and the recently famous Agent Dave Norton, who had become known for being the man to take down infamous Midwest bank robber Michael Townley in Ludendorff, North Yankton.
by 2008, Steve would become host of a series which has at times directly competed with our programs here on Weasel, CNT's The Underbelly of Paradise. How exactly the show was created remains anyone's guess, but we suspect that it was directly funded and approved by the Bureau itself, who likely chose Steve to host it due to his already by then successful career in the City of Saints. Whatever the case, Steve would begin hosting the show which, in a similar vein to our own, explored the vast underworld of the gang scene in San Andreas, but with a more direct approach. Through a combination of scripting, ad-libbing, and direct involvement on the streets with officers of the LSPD, Steve would become a celebrity thanks to the series, which became an overnight hit, providing Haynes with the taste of recognition he sought for a supposedly selfless crusade against criminal terror. Over the course of the next five years, Steve would become known by name to the many citizens, politicians, and gangsters of Los Santos and Greater Blaine County, working to take down gangland operations primarily, which targeted groups like the Families, Balas, and Vagos, as well as outfits like the West Coast chapter of the Lost MC. Through his newfound fame and infamy, Steve would slowly amass a fortune of finances and of friends in many very influential high places. He would at some point become friends with billionaire venture capitalist Devin Weston, and likely begin using said relationship to procure additional funds for a conflict his bureau had been engaged in for decades. Since time immemorial, it seems, the FIB has been known to directly compete for funding with the similar foreign affairs branch of the federal government in the International Affairs Agency, or IAA. This funding conflict would reach a boiling point when in 2013, the agency and the bureau both begin trying to find and detain a suspected jihadist, Ferdinand Karamov. When Karamov is abducted by the agency and they report him dead, Steve would become furious at the potential loss for the bureau until fortune shined on him at just the right time. Or so he must have thought. <laughs> It just so happens that at this time a robbery would take place in Rockford Hills, with one robber in particular brandishing his familiar calling card and raising suspicion in Steve. Having been aware of the intense news coverage from the time, Steve would almost immediately suspect that the robber was the infamous Michael Townley and begin investigating his own employee Dave Norton's connections with the incident in Ludendorff nine years prior. Steve would discover Norton's cover-up of Michael's death and the subsequent deal he'd made with him to exchange his friends for a new life living in sunny Los Santos under a new name, Michael DeSanta. Steve would begin pressuring Dave to use his leverage on Michael to convince him to aid in Steve's continued war against the IAA. Believing Michael to be the perfect man for the job of verifying Ferdinand Karamov's death at the agency's hands, he would employ the former bank robber through Dave and have him infiltrate the coroner's office in Strawberry to locate the body. After successfully verifying that Karamov was not in fact dead, and likely being held by the agency, Steve would have Dave bring him to the Bureau headquarters, to personally meet his new instrument of patriotic terror. Well, isn't this nice? You didn't tell me we were double dating. Sorry guys, this part of the love is all mine. <laughs> Brilliant! Steve Haynes, amigo, but you probably knew that already. Sorry, your name tag must have fallen off. Oh, <laughs> duh! I love it! I, I gotta remember to write that down. <laughs> and to shoot you in your head, you annoying dick. <laughs> Andreas, taking notes? This stuff? Whoa! Pure magic. I should put it on my show. Have you seen my show? You mean how to dress like a salesman on a cheap golf weekend at a third-rate country club? <laughs> so, well done with our, uh, our friend, Mr. K. My pleasure. Uh, I love helping our government wage war. Especially with itself. But you made a mistake. Did I, Cupcake? Why don't you keep your fucking voice down before I close your fucking windpipe? The joke stopped now, pal. You will show me and my team some respect. Maybe you could define team for me. Is that just the three of you? Or the greater FIB? Or the entire government? Because I'm tempted to argue that thus far, we haven't shown a lot of your colleagues a whole lot of respect. <coughs> And why don't you start with me, genius? You got it, pal. We have received intel that they're keeping Mr. K at the local agency station. I just dealt with that guy. The agency is stepping up their questioning because of your moronic antics down at the coroner's office. We need to get him out of there before he blabs. I did what Agent Norton said. 
Then I guess you getting involved with a clapped out old agent who's been living off of past glories was your first mistake. You are my boy now, amigo. Huh. My career depends on this. And that's very important to me. So seeing as we're all boys now, that makes it important to you. Now run along, kids. See, there you go, Dave. With Michael and his new crew now firmly under the FIB's thumb, he would task the team with kidnapping Karamov from the agency's HQ building in downtown Los Santos, providing them with a helicopter for the operation, but little else. Against all logical odds, Michael and his new team of maniac meth dealer Trevor Phillips and Chamberlain Hills gangster Franklin Clinton would successfully manage to retrieve Karamov in the most dramatic fashion possible, delivering him safely to the drop-off point in El Burro Heights. The incident would be so brazen and be witnessed by so many civilians that a subsequent cover-up by the agency would even be necessary, explaining the event as a training exercise. From our Weasel News archives at the time of the incident, quote, Eyewitnesses believed they had just seen the crime of the century, an audacious raid on the IAA headquarters in downtown Los Santos, in which a man was snatched from an office by a suspect hanging from a helicopter before both escaped. Not so, according to the IAA. Agency spokeswoman Lucinda Jacob told reporters the incident was merely a training exercise and nothing to be concerned by. We are constantly training and yesterday was no exception. An agent posing as a terror suspect was snatched in a practice raid to see how our systems and processes responded to extreme duress. Despite problems with our funding, people should be relieved to know our systems worked great. You're in safe hands, Jacob said. End quote. With Karamov in custody, he would be brought to the Walker and Sons warehouse, <clears throat> different guy, in Banning to await interrogation. Having done his homework on his new assets, Steve would employ Michael's old running buddy, Trevor Phillips, to personally torture Mr. K, to obtain information on the suspected Azerbaijani terrorist, Tahir Javan. See his face that last time I popped it. Boom! Oh, ladies! God, you're an asshole. You. You back there. I know you, but you? You I don't know. Yeah, well, until I see reason otherwise, why don't we just keep it that way? Steve, what a pleasure, bro. Oh! He <laughs> <laughs> reminds me of one of those guys you see advertising pills for middle-aged men that can't get erections. <laughs> hey, Devin Weston? It's a very good friend of mine, so why don't you watch your tongue? Because let me tell you something, that guy gets more tail than, uh... <laughs> than a tail catcher! <laughs> I have to fucking remember that line. You. Mm. Where did we meet? Nowhere, pal. Yeah, we did. Hey, oh, what are we doing here, huh? This. Please, keep this little bastard away from me. No, no, no. no. Ferdinand, he's gone. He's gone. It's okay, I've got some new friends here now. No, this okay. is Michael, and this, this is Trevor. No. Now our friend here, he claims he doesn't know I anything. Don't, I don't know anything. I don't know, I already told nothing. Nothing, I don't know anything. Please, please, sir. You know about the Azerbaijanis? Huh? Azerbaijanis. I do audiovisual, hi-fi audiovisual. It's top man, good price, VIP. No, no. You're so. a fucking spy. <laughs> and the asswipes at the agency know this. So I need to know. What did you tell them? And what did they tell you? I, I, hmm? told, I told them what I tell you. Uh-huh. What? I... Hey! This whoa, 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 what is this? The house in Rockwood Hills. The man who owns it. He works at the consulate. Oh, that's all I know. That's it. That's it. That's it. I go. You're gonna make him speak. No, 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 no. You I two are gonna drive up to Rockford Hills. No. And when we find out which man is the man with the problem, you put him down. No, 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 no. Because no, I'm tired no. of these fucking nitwits at the agency taking all the glory. Let me go. All right, fuck is all this, huh? I think it's a good time, buddy. You know, go no, for a drive. Wait, wait. No, you get to work, and uh, I'm not here. <laughs> in what is perhaps one of the most disgusting and blatant abuses of authority by our federal government, Steve would authorize and personally oversee the torture of Ferdinand Karamov at Trevor's hands, and continuously prompt Trevor to ply him for information using whatever methods the lunatic deemed necessary. 
Eventually, after merciless treatment from Mr. Phillips, Karamov would provide Steve with enough information to give Michael for the assassination to be successful. Michael would shoot Javon dead at his home in Chumash, and Steve would deem the operation a success. With Javon dead, he would order Trevor to dispose of him, having outlived his usefulness. However, Trevor, having no love for Steve or the government in general, would refuse this order. For more information on the fate of Ferdinand Karamov, see our episode on Trevor Phillips from Season 1. Woo! That is a wrap, my friends! Excellent work to the pair of you! Now, I got a racquetball <sighs> game to get to, so Trevor, if you take care of Mr. K, I think we're all set. What the <coughs> fuck do you want me to do with him? I would say he's outlived his usefulness. Oh, come on, please. Shut up! That's a sport. This is Weasel News. Philanthropist murdered at a house party in Chumash. Chad and Shanice Mulligan getting divorced. A super club is coming to East Los Santos. Partygoers at a house in Chumash were horrified when a guest was killed seemingly by a sniper's bullet. Tahir Javan was smoking on an outside terrace when he was gunned down. Police are baffled as to why this much-loved Azerbaijani-American, who was a noted philanthropist and community leader, would be targeted. With a single battle won, but many more to come in his eyes, Steve would begin planning his next move against the agency. He would meet with Michael's team to briefly explain his justification for being as blatantly corrupt as he was, whilst simultaneously maintaining his trademark self-righteousness. The agency, as he told it, was embroiled in funding terror on the streets of America, and abroad, through the sale of drugs, in a bid to ironically maintain said funding. Steve would task Michael's team with robbing an IAA bonds truck as it delivered the cash so that the Bureau could use the money for their own domestic operations. I'm in charge here, Fruity! Me! You understand? Uh, not quite. Well, can you explain that again? What I was saying! <laughs> oh, you're good. The three cunts! Listen, we need help with something else. Some of the government, some of it is pretty corrupt. Not, uh, not your bit, right? Yes, but we're corrupt in a good way. But the agency, they want to encourage panic so they can guarantee their budgets. That's how they get paid! It's a major problem. And now they've secured some... funds that we need to use in our fight against crime as a way of bribing corrupt officials. Really? And where are they getting that from? Drugs. Those bastards love to sell drugs. Who doesn't? We think they're going to use this money to finance a war on our streets, and we need you boys to requisition that money for us. The Bonds are leaving the terminal in an armored car. Yeah, fuck you, Dave. We don't have time to prepare the right way. <laughs> it's not my concern. I cannot allocate any more resources to this. You'll be fine. Fuck you, Dave. Caring little for the details of how the operation was conducted, Steve would once again leave Michael and his team to their own devices in arranging the robbery. Using a successful blitz play maneuver, the team would complete the mission and hand over the money, much to their frustration, to Devin Weston, who presumably held or possibly invested the money for Steve. Exactly what became of the money obtained from the blitz play remains unclear, as not a few short weeks later, Steve would once again meet up with Michael, sheltering with Trevor Phillips in Blaine County, after angering drug lord Martin Madrazzo. Completely indifferent to Michael and Trevor's situation, he would task them with planning yet another robbery, this time, whatever they wanted, so long as they made enough money to pay for the expensive equipment needed for his next objective. Hello? Oh, ladies, ladies, what's up? Fuck off! Listen, I'm sorry, but we've got a problem. Government funding thing. We need you to uh, uh, investigate a research lab upstate. It's about terrorism, the big one, nerve gas, biological terror. Thank God I don't pay tax. Uh, listen, you'll need some fairly standard gear. A boat, tandem rotor heavy lift helicopter, truck, weapons. You'll have to source all of that. <laughs> Chopper alone will set you back a couple of mil. Oh, no worries there. Trevor here, he just came into a lot of money. Is that sarcasm? Oh, you're fucking A right at sarcasm. You fuck. A few weeks ago, I was happily retired, sulking by my swimming pool. And my psychotic best friend shows up out of nowhere to torture me over mistakes I made, honest mistakes I made over a decade ago. We, our little posse, are flat fucking broke. 
But hey, let's go out and spend two million dollars on a tandem rotor fucking chopper so I can go steal nerve gas from fucking terrorists. Forgive me, you ignorant fuck. But sarcasm is all I fucking got. Sarcasm and a room full of you cunts. Yes. Woo. Welcome back, man. It is the old you. Yeah, 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 well, we gotta go. It's been great, but Dave here's got a Pilates class. Now remember, ladies, you keep us way out of this thing. Bye-bye. Once again, keeping his distance far from the details of the robbery, Steve would send Agent Andreas Sanchez to meet the crew after they pulled off one of the most violent and destructive heists in the history of Blaine County, when they robbed the Blaine County Savings Bank in Polito Bay. Let's go. Yo. Ah. Easy, easy. I'm a friendly. Agent Sanchez. Our very own corrupt G-man in training. You gotta be careful, buddy, all right? Because they are uh, looking around these trains for illegals. And if you're mistaken, you'll be shot, amigo. Very amusing. Yeah, if you expecting them two to bring you up, you're gonna be disappointed, homie. Right back at you. Got the money? Everything we got. Okay. And here's your cut. Considering present scrutiny on public worker remuneration, this is a big win. Oh yeah, that's a huge fucking win. Woo! Monsters. I'm out. Agent Haynes will get in touch with you once Operation Save the World to go. Get your crew together, okay? Fucking punk. This is Weasel News. Sleepy town of Polito Bay wakes up to violent bank robbery. Blaine County Savings Bank in quiet Polito Bay was robbed by three men who escaped in suits made of body armor. The bank robbers engaged in a rolling gun battle with police through the quiet town's main street, and it is believed that a fourth accomplice aided their escape. This is the second time Polito Bay has been in the news of late after recent allegations of corruption in its police force. Weasel News, confirming your prejudices. Believing the IAA to be planning a massive terrorist attack in order to secure their government funding, Steve would begin planning an infiltration of the Humane Labs Research Center by Michael's team. Their goal would be to locate and extract a supposedly deadly neurotoxin that the agency was planning to release in major urban American centers, to cause massive chaos and drive up their funding. Upon arriving at Cape Catfish to brief Michael, Trevor, and Franklin, however, he would discover that they had neglected to bring three additional men for the job, something he'd mistakenly believed Dave Norton had informed them of. Hey, where's the other three? What other three? We told you to bring along six. This is a six-man job. No, you didn't. You Dave did? No, Dave didn't. You said you'd do it. That is a frickin' lie. I do not get things wrong. All right, great. Then we're out of here. Uh, uh, Fuck uh, uh, it. Let's go. You three can do it alone. And die? Fuck you. You do your own dirty work. Hey, I do my dirty work every day, keeping the country safe from scum like you. And you're doing a great job, sir. Hey, you want this job done? Then come with us, huh? Come on. Come on, Mr. Leisure Wear, Mr. Depressed Accountant. Let's go save America. Who the fuck are we saving it from this time? This is the real deal. My sources are convinced there's a plot in international affairs, you know, the agency, and they're using this facility to make a serious nerve toxin. Ah, <laughs> bullshit. Yeah, which they plan in their mind-blowing insanity to let a major terrorist release on a metropolitan area so they can continue to get funding. Nothing increases funding for fighting terrorism more than successful acts of terrorism. <laughs> all, right, so, so, all right, so let me get this straight then. No, 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 there is no getting it straight. That's the point. Now we're doing this! You two are on getaway. Fuck off and make it happen. Michael, you're with us! What size flipper you wear? Major Norton, it's been a while since you were in the field. The sight of you in neoprene is something we say for our worst enemies. Shut up, I'll be fine. And you, get in. You're driving. So maybe I redeem myself, get killed in the process, huh? That old bullshit. No one is dying on my watch. 
Not even the burnout bank robber with temper issues and nothing to live for. A hero's death is too good for you. You'll die in the ignominy you deserve. Oh, thank God. Fate shall carry me safe through these selfless acts of charity. With little choice and little time to execute the operation, the six-man job would become a five-man job, with Michael, Dave, and Steve personally donning scuba gear and heavy weapons to infiltrate the labs via an underwater tunnel. The team would break into the building successfully and push their way through the facility to obtain the neurotoxin, but eventually, their cover would be blown and chaos would erupt. Ah. Ah. Oh, how are we? Huh? We ready? I was born ready. Let's do this. Come on, Dave. What's the plan? Hey, hey, hey. We locate the toxin and action our escape strategy. That's what we got. Forced to fight their way out of the building, Steve would hastily decide to try and pose as one of the men shot in the gunfight against Michael's team, turning his pistol on himself to really sell the lie, while Michael, Dave, and his team escaped with the toxin. We missed the window. Agency response team's already in the building. It's never too late. We're going! Let's go! It's too risky, Bandito! That bird goes down and takes half the West Coast with it! You know what? If you're done puking up excuses, how about we come up with a solution? Okay, okay! Alright, yeah, uh, you go, I'll stay in cover! Fuck it, fine by me! And the dead bodies! I'm lucky I'm not one of them! Come on! Let's go! FIB, special agent, I got this covered! Detain this man! Fuck you, I should detain you, I just took a bullet from my country! From our Weasel News archives at the time of the raid, quote, A violent break-in at a biotech lab in the San Chiansky Mountains ended in bloodshed, mayhem, and the loss of a formula for cheap perfume. The meticulously planned raid appears to have been carried out by highly skilled professionals, as thieves swam into the facility using diving equipment to access an underwater drainage pipe. Several research scientists and security personnel were killed at the facility, which has been attacked by animal welfare activists in the past. The facility was once believed to have been a testing center for chemical and biological weapons, but those rumors have long been dispelled, and now the facility tests soaps, high-tech face creams, and cosmetics. Agents are baffled as to the scale of the raid, as the perfume formula stolen was not considered particularly valuable. End quote. Though Steve would try desperately to explain his presence at the Humane Labs raid to his superiors, Following the incident, he would fall under increased scrutiny from the Bureau for his controversial methods. Becoming increasingly paranoid, and beginning to show his true priorities, Steve would at this time order Michael and his crew to conduct one final job, infiltrate the FIB's headquarters downtown, and delete any evidence of his involvement with the Humane Labs raid. Has he briefed you? Oh, well, yes he has. He told us that if we do what you say, then together we can take down the big bad wolf that is government <laughs> corruption. Yeah, and if you don't? We're all gonna fry, because the agency's onto us. I've even got some fools in our own bureau that are questioning my methods. <laughs> Think I'm a liar, <laughs> a cheater, some kind of a killer and a thief! So? So, there's some, uh, evidence. And I need you guys to find out what they know. All right, so what? You want Lester here to hack into the system, wipe it all clean? No, 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 that will not work. The only way to access it is through your buildings. Fuck me. <laughs> Michael, you'd be doing me a very big favor. And if you do this, I will make sure that all your files are deleted. I promise you. Hey! It's the last thing we do, and we're done. Period. Of course. I'm a man of my word. Dave, let's go! Come on, Lester, let's go. Good luck, gentlemen. Once again, defying all odds and logic, Michael and his crew would actually pull off another impossible heist and infiltrate the FIB's HQ. Though the details of the robbery remain disputed, everyone agrees that the building was heavily damaged by fires, caused by either a supposed crashed helicopter or planted incendiary devices. Either way, Steve Haynes himself would be put in charge of a team seeking to bring the robbers to justice. With pressure mounting at the Bureau and existing liabilities making him increasingly nervous, Steve would meet with Dave and Michael shortly after the Bureau raid at the court center outside of town. He would plan to have both men arrested, with help from his underling, Andreas Sanchez. But when both Michael and Dave draw their weapons, the four men would end up in a near-Mexican standoff, 
with Dave attempting to appeal to what little rationality Steve still had. There's a bit of a problem. That's right, Davey boy, you could say that. Steve, I told you I would handle oh, this. Oh, because you've handled everything so fucking well so far, haven't you? All right, I admit things have been a little unorthodox, I'm but- I'm fucking orthodox! You've ruined my career! Agent Sanchez, arrest these men, both oh, of them. Steve, oh, come whoa! On, please. You fucking kidding me? Arrest me for what? For multiple counts of every fucking crime under the fucking sun. Oh, well, then let me rephrase. Why? Why? Because. Because you don't want me to testify in court about our various business dealings, right? Agent Sanchez, apprehend the suspect! Agent Sanchez, you'll do no such thing. Now, Steve, we agreed to speak to Michael, to try and explain things to him, not this. This causes problems for us all. Okay, okay. Then put your gun down and we'll talk. After you, buddy. Come on, where's the trust? You can do better than that. They know or think they know that I'm the one that was behind the incident. Uh-huh. And now you want me to clean up your mess again, right? Before I end up at the bottom of the ocean. Fucking good luck with that. Put the weapons down, boys. Fun time is over. We've got you. Anti-American activity. Put your weapons down, all of you. Who the fuck are you with? With me. You fucking rat. I knew you didn't have the balls for this. For the record, I'm a patriot. I love my country. Put the weapons down. Fuck you. We all know you agency boys are ball deep in a plot to drive up your funding by any means necessary. Boys, the gun down, gentlemen. Who the fuck are they? Fucking Merriweather. What are they doing here? Steve, put your gun down. Oh, same goddamn leg. Go! When the situation devolves into chaos following the arrival of the IAA and Merriweather, as well as the reveal of his own man working against him in Andreas, Steve would manage to escape by the seat of his pants. Weasel News. City in panic. Massive shootout involving IAA, FIB, Merriweather, and unknown terror elements. The War on Terror. We lead with the horror show at the court center, where a terror incident was foiled by a combination of forces from the FIB and the IAA. Some witnesses even believe Merriweather Security Services may have helped calm things down. Scott McSimmons is at the scene. Yes, it's carnage here, and also not a little confusing. No one is quite sure what happened, but thanks to their utter professionalism, our security forces were able to have people at the scene of the crime almost as soon as it began. An attempt to arrest a terror suspect seems to have gotten into a gun battle. No one is quite sure what comes next for a city in panic. Back to you, Sheila. That was Weasel News. Though he would later calm down enough to give up his attempt at arresting Dave Norton, he would be so furious and paranoid at this point that he would call for the deaths of Michael's entire crew, much to the frustration of Dave. Eventually, Dave would manage to talk Steve down from killing all three, settling instead with killing Trevor Phillips alone, who had also shown up at the court center fiasco and easily represented his biggest liability. With Michael unable to get near Trevor and therefore out of the question, Steve and Dave would approach gangbanger Franklin Clinton with orders to kill Phillips or face the consequences of their authority. Oh! What's up, playa? Hello, Franklin. Man, I don't know y'all. We done, Hey, man. we ain't done yet, homie. Not yet. Nearly. Man, what the fuck y'all want me to do? Kill the president? Fuck his wife or something, or invade some fucking country. No, no, something more sensible. Something that's gotta be done. Hey, when the timing's right, you're gonna take old Trevor and put him out the pasture. Oh, me? Michael will be sensible, but Trevor... Trevor won't be. Trevor is a liability that none of us can afford. Man, Trevor saved you. He saved both y'all asses. And it's unfortunate. Hey, when we give you the word, you're gonna do this thing. Man, get Michael to do it. Me and Trevor cool, dawg. Michael can't do it. Trevor won't let him near. That's why it's up to you, homie. Unfortunately for Steve, however, his underestimation of Michael, Trevor, and Franklin's own bond as criminals would be his undoing. Believing Trevor to be a dead man walking at Franklin's hands and unaware of the counteroffer made to Clinton by Steve's supposed friend, Devin Weston, to kill Michael, Steve would relax and return to filming for the underbelly of paradise, believing all of his problems to slowly be solving themselves. However, after making a deal to work together and take down all of their enemies, Michael, Trevor, and Franklin would orchestrate the assassination of gangsters Wei Cheng and Harold Stretch Joseph, along with Devin Weston, and eventually, Steve himself. While filming for his series at the Del Perro Pier, Steve would be shot dead by Trevor Phillips. Los Santos. A city of saints. A city of sinners. And nothing in between but the FIB. 
cut! Ugh, this is crap! Who writes this bullshit anyway? Okay, all right. You got this framed right? Mm, yeah, you're looking great. Is the chin? How's the chin? Oh, sharp. All right, the audio's clean? Nice. Uh, well, say something. Uh, check, check, check. Yeah, it's great. Okay, fine. We're on. I'm ready. You ready? Speed. All right, let's do this, people. I'm a professional. Let's go. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Steve Haynes. Les, see if you can patch me into his radio mic. I want a last reminder of what an annoying prick he is. A city of scumbags. The last great American melting pot. Two parts. Oh my god! Guy! What's his name? He shot him! From the journal The Los Santos Meteor following Steve's death, quote, Steve Haynes, decorated FIB agent and host of the popular TV show The Underbelly of Paradise, unwittingly helped expose that underbelly further yesterday as he was assassinated while filming a segment of his TV show on the Ferris wheel on Del Perro Pier. Agent Haynes, who had twice recently been injured in the line of duty, had been an agent for nearly 20 years and a TV host for five. FIB spokesman Gary Lane told the Los Santos Meteor, Agent Haynes died a hero, doing what he loved, which was presenting a TV show. He really helped combine the chaos of anti-terrorism and the mindlessness of network television into one highly successful career. Mr. Haynes, who was not married, lived with his mother. Steve Haynes was an opportunistic, manipulative career man that had absolutely no qualms with bending the rules of the Bureau, and by extension, the law, to advance his career in the name of protecting his country. Haynes was exceedingly arrogant, a trait which was likely exacerbated by his unprecedented early service in the FIB and subsequent decorated career. When behind the camera, Steve presented himself as a competent, dependable, and honest example of America's finest, fighting the war on drugs and corruption on the streets. But in reality, he was a foul-mouthed, arrogant, and corrupted man, who was callously indifferent to the plight of essentially anyone that wasn't himself. Steve was also shown to have a short fuse, and was often quick to use violence as a means of displaying his authority, on top of casually ordering it almost every day for the Bureau's and usually his own purposes. He seemed to believe his own hype despite everyone else's lack of conviction, and would often embarrass himself in attempts to have the last word of witty repartee, lacking any sense of self-awareness when his comebacks fell flat. He also seemed to genuinely believe that he was advancing a cause of good in the course of advancing his career, and undermining the IAA, spending time justifying his actions to the team, his employers, and himself, while apparently blissfully unaware of how unconvincing he truly was. Unsurprisingly, Steve's attitude and arrogance would earn him few, if any, real friends, and he would be hated by nearly everyone around him, from Dave Norton to Michael DeSanta and Trevor Phillips, and even his supposed friend Devin Weston, who described Haynes as a clown. Steve was willing to have people killed, tortured, and just about anything in between at the drop of a hat, if it served to advance his career. Being prepared to have a man killed in the search for Tahir Javan simply for being of Azerbaijani descent, or have Ferdinand Karamov interrogated by Trevor to loosen him up. He even joked about calling an airstrike on Chumash Beach to ensure they got their target, though whether or not Steve was actually crazy enough to ever do something that brazen remains to be seen. Above all else, Steve was an opportunist, who cared only for himself and his career as an FIB agent, willing to sacrifice friend and foe alike in order to continue climbing the ladder of success. He appears to have been motivated almost exclusively by a desire to be famous and recognized for his services to the country, and may have even sacrificed a personal life in order to focus on his career. Steve also apparently lived with his mother his entire life, and we were able to confirm that he never had a wife or children of any sort. In fact, he doesn't appear to have had any real tangible relationships beyond his mother, outside of those he coerced into being through his position at the Bureau. In the end, Steve was an isolated, paranoid, and single-minded individual who may have avoided his downfall had he only been willing to play by the book.
Steve Haynes was an above-average height Caucasian man with orange-brown hair and blue eyes. While not excessively muscular or overweight, Steve was in good shape at the time of his death, and likely worked out with some regularity given his frequent appearances on television and desire to look his best. In true narcissistic fashion, Steve often opted for casual upper-class polos and jeans in most settings, and while it is not known if he was a fan of the sport, he certainly seemed to embody the spirit of a typical Rockford Hills golfing enthusiast. Classifying Steve's crimes is slightly more complicated than the average subject we see here on this series. Given his position within the FIB, and the fact that he was never successfully exposed in his lifetime, it's difficult to say if he was technically guilty of much beyond the murder of Andreas Sanchez, at least in the eyes of the great American justice system. That being said, hindsight is 2020 and a real bitch, so we will endeavor to evaluate what exactly Steve would be guilty of, had the courts been given the opportunity to take him to task. Given that little is known about his career in detail prior to his involvement with Michael DeSantis' crew in 2013, we will begin there when examining his potential rap sheet, starting with Accessory conspiracy murder, breaking and entering, when ordering Michael through Dave to infiltrate the Los Santos coroner's office. Accessory conspiracy murder, terrorism, and kidnapping, when ordering Michael's crew to kidnap Ferdinand Karamov. Accessory Conspiracy Murder, Torture, when ordering Trevor Phillips to interrogate Mr. K and ordering Michael to assassinate Tahir Javan. Accessory Conspiracy Murder, Armed Robbery, when ordering Michael's crew to rob an IAA bonds truck. Accessory Conspiracy Murder, Armed Robbery, Theft, and Destruction of Private Property, when ordering Michael's crew to steal money for a planned raid. Murder, Accessory Conspiracy Murder, Treason, Destruction of Government Property, Theft, and trespassing on private government property when infiltrating the Humane Labs Research Center and shooting his way through the building alongside Michael and Dave. Accessory conspiracy murder, theft, trespassing on government property, terrorism, and destruction of government property when ordering Michael's crew to rob the FIB headquarters. The murder of Andreas Sanchez. Ordering the death of Trevor Phillips. We would like to emphasize that we feel we have only scratched the surface of Steve's potential criminal record tonight, and that if our American justice system were truly just, Steve would have been in a jail cell long before he was deprived of the opportunity by his criminal associations. While our government might officially deny any crimes committed by one of their most decorated agents of order secretly working as an agent of chaos, we here at GTA Biographies are not fooled and we are proud to continue bringing you the truth in delicious, digestible tidbits laden with advertisements. What causes a man to become so utterly convinced of his own greatness despite all the evidence to the contrary, America? Is there hope for men like Steve Haynes, successful enough to exercise power but too incompetent and self-concerned to do anything good with it? One can never say, but what we can say is America is a dangerous place, folks. Stay indoors, people. You never know if the host of your favorite program is secretly working at gunpoint for armed thugs and desperately trying to reach you through coded language that he sneaks past the editors. I'll see you next time for the Season 2 finale of Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching.